good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Holy Trinity on this fourth Sunday of Easter. We're so happy to have you here with us. The first announcement I have before we get started is a huge thank you to RJ Chambers for filling in for John Bruck today to make sure we have beautiful music. We are blessed to have him here. Two other quick announcements before we get started is the first is to remember that as of June 5th, we will be having one Sunday service at 10 o'clock. So starting June 5th, going forward every Sunday, one service at 10. My last announcement is this Saturday, everyone is invited to join us in the upper hall for our speaker series at 11 a.m. This month, we have Heather Coleman, who is giving a very poignant and timely talk on the religious dimensions of the war in Ukraine. So if you are able to make it, please do come 11 o'clock in the upper hall. It's always an amazing, enlightening, and educational time to come to. With that said, I invite everyone to take a few moments as we prepare our hearts and minds as we enter into morning worship. I invite the congregation to please stand as able as we sing our processional hymn, number 323, Ye Holy Angels Bright.
conflict of the day. Eternal God, from whose gentle hand none can snatch us away, give us faith to believe that we are known and loved with a passion strong enough to bring the whole world back to you. Through Jesus Christ, who is one with you, the source of life. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for our first reading. A reading from the book of Acts. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time, she became ill and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, who heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him with the request, please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put all of them outside, and then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then, calling the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, a tanner. The word of the Lord. you to be seated for our second reading.
A reading from the book of Revelation. After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, singing, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, robed in white, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple, and the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The word of the Lord. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. At that time, the festival of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple, in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I have told you, and you do not believe me. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me, but you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else, and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. This is the Gospel of Christ. of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. This morning is traditionally called Good Shepherd Sunday. Every year, in every cycle of our lectionary, and there's three, the fourth Sunday of Easter is deemed Good Shepherd Sunday. Each year we get three readings and a psalm which all perfectly mix and match and align with each other. They align with the theme of Jesus being the Good Shepherd. 
The readings don't always stand out as shepherd stories initially, but when we start to dive into them, the theme of the Good Shepherd, the theme of our duty to feed and tend the flock, becomes prominent. This year, I'm happy to report, is no different. Our reading from Acts is one of those stories that probably doesn't initially scream Good Shepherd to us. However, it's probably, in my opinion, the best and most direct and honest depiction of what it actually means when Jesus asks us to tend his sheep, feed his flock, help the lambs. Acts opens up with Peter, the same Peter we talked about last week, Simon Peter, the one who has had ups and downs with understanding the mission here on earth. Yet last week, Peter had a breakthrough. He left behind his old way of living and took Jesus seriously when Jesus said to him, follow me. This week, the story places Peter in Lydda, which was near Joppa, where the people of Joppa had just experienced the death of their beloved Tabitha. Sidebar about Tabitha before we go any further, because I always find this fact very interesting. Tabitha, or in Greek, Dorcas, is the only woman explicitly called a disciple in the New Testament. We know there's others. But Tabitha is the only female explicitly called a disciple in the New Testament. Acts literally begins by saying, Now in Joppa there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha. So what do we know about Tabitha besides that she's a disciple? We're not told a whole lot. But a few things we are told speak volumes as to the type of person that Tabitha was. The Greek name Dorcas literally translates into the English word deer. That's deer with an A, not two E's, very different. So we're told, and we can assume through the translation of her name, that Tabitha was sweet. Tabitha was caring. Tabitha was dear to those around her. In fact, we know that Tabitha was a beloved member of the community who was known for her good works and her charitable deeds. We can assume, as those who loved her showed Peter the tunics and other clothing that she had made, we can assume that perhaps Tabitha made and provided clothing for the community, made what was needed, ensured everyone had what they needed. We also know Tabitha was surrounded by widows. Perhaps she is caring for those who are now alone, for those who have no one else, the downtrodden, the forgotten, the neglected. We know Tabitha was dear. We know she helped others, and we know that she died, and her community took care of her body. They washed her body, and they laid her in a bed. What happened next is what I find so amazing. Tabitha died, her body was prepped, and they sent for Peter. I've always wondered, what did they expect Peter to do? Did they expect Peter to come, see Tabitha dead in the bed, and perform a miracle in which they'd never seen Peter do before? In fact, they'd only ever heard of that Jesus fellow bringing people back to life. Bringing people back to life wasn't a common thing. It wasn't a parlor trick. They weren't hoping to create a zombie army in Joppa, at least not that I've read. So I wonder, did they expect Peter to pull a miracle out of this bag of tricks? Or, and this is what I think, what I lean more heavily towards, did they expect and need Peter to help them in their grief after losing someone they loved so dearly? After all, Peter knew grief. Peter knew the grief of denying someone you loved, someone who helped you, held you, loved you, and saw the good in you. Peter knew the grief of his best friend dying, the grief of knowing that even though he couldn't have prevented that death, 
He could have at least been there with his friend and his family during what was a truly difficult time. Peter knew the grief of disbelief. Peter knew the shame in not truly understanding the resurrection and waiting for the resurrection that his dear friend promised him and all of their companions. Peter knew grief, deep and profound grief. Suffice to say, more than likely, I believe Peter was called to help this family, to help this community walk through their grief because Peter himself had walked through tremendous grief himself. So our scene is set with Peter being retrieved from Lydda, being brought to Joppa, to the house in which the clean, loved body of the dear disciple Tabitha lies in the room upstairs. Peter arrives. Peter sees and is among all of the widows who are deeply grieved and does something that we've seen before. There's something about what happens next that feels familiar. This storyline feels familiar. We're told that Peter clears the house. Just like Jesus cleared a house of all guests with the exception of the parents of a seemingly dead 12-year-old girl in the Gospel of Mark, right before he says to that little girl, Talitha kum, or little girl, get up. Peter cleared everyone out of the room in which the body of Tabitha lay. I love the symmetry between these two instances of healing, between these two females being brought back to life. The death, the grieving, the despair, all so similar. Yet the presence of God, the one simple command, the faith, the trust, in Greek, Tabitha kum, translated in English, Tabitha, arise. It's almost like Peter could hear Jesus in his head, walking him through what to do, how to do it, how to be a healing presence in the midst of such sorrow. It's almost like God works, truly works, through each and every one of us. Peter had seen this work before. He knew prayer worked. He knew God was faithful. He knew Jesus sent him on a mission to heal, to love, to help, and to bring people together. So Peter, in his faith, tried to do exactly what Jesus taught him to do. Peter let the actions of Jesus lead him in his care of this grieving family, in the care of this well-loved and dear member of the community. And we know what happened next. Tabitha opened her eyes and she sat up. Tabitha was no longer the beloved member of the community who had died in the upper room, but she was now the very much alive disciple who was known for her presence and her good deeds. Tabitha was alive among the people. I think it's important here, as another sidebar, to highlight that Tabitha wasn't resurrected. She was resuscitated, though through a new and different method. Tabitha would die again. Yet for the first time being, yet for the first time being, her ministry to others in Joppa was still needed. It wasn't finished. She would die again, but not yet. I love this story when we remember Jesus' words to Peter last week. Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my flock. Peter was doing just this. Peter was following the words of the great shepherd. Peter healed Tabitha through the power and grace and love and healing powers of God. Through Peter's faith in something, through his faith in someone outside of himself, Peter knew that great things could happen, they had happened, and that everything, even those things we think are impossible, are worth trying. Peter's faith shows us that no one is beyond our help. Peter's faith and trust in God shows us that no one is too far gone that the love of Christ can't reach them and breathe new life into their very lungs. 
Now, I'm not saying that we decide to storm the local morgue and try some resuscitation tricks of our own. That would be weird and creepy, and I will deny knowing each and every one of you if I get that phone call. But what I am saying is that there is power in a ministry of presence. And that's exactly what I think Peter did and was. Peter was present. And that's exactly what Jesus is asking us to do and to be when Jesus asks each and every one of us to tend his sheep. Being present in a world where presence is a commodity to so many is an invaluable resource. Being ears to listen when someone just needs to talk or to vent is incredibly important. Being eyes to see when someone just needs to know that they are visible to the world is incredibly powerful. Being hands and arms when someone needs someone to care for them or to hold them in a simple embrace, when it feels like the entire world would rather push them away than hold them close, is a ministry of presence in which the power, the love, and the mercy knows no bounds. Just as God worked through Peter, God works and exists through each of us. And this isn't something that we should hoard away for ourselves, but it's something we should share with others. God works through us. And when we practice a ministry of presence with others, we extend that glorious power of God to each and every person we encounter. When we live life this way, when we live by the glorious miracle of the resurrection of Christ, and we follow the commandment to love and to serve and to be present for those we encounter, we can truly then embrace the words that Jesus says in this morning's gospel when Jesus proclaims, My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. And to that I say, praise be to God. Alleluia, the Lord is risen. I invite the congregation to please stand as able as we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed as we say, We believe in one God. I invite the congregation to assume whatever posture you find most prayerful for the prayers of the people. As we continue to celebrate Christ's resurrection this Easter season, 
for the presence of the warmer months. Let us now pray for the church and the world, saying, Lord, in your mercy. In your mercy. Let us pray for our bishops, priests, and deacons, and their helpers in the church. In our Diocese of Edmonton, we pray for Larry, the Lutheran Bishop of Alberta and Territories, and for our Bishop Stephen, and for Holy Trinity Parish in Edson and their rector, Johnny. And in the National Church, we pray for Linda, our primate, Gregory, our metropolitan, and for the Diocese of Montreal and their Bishop Mary. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Let us now pray for all of God's people throughout the world, for this congregation, and for all the ministers and people who witness to your love. We pray especially for our brothers and sisters in God overseas, for our sister diocese of Bouye in Burundi, and for the people of Niamabouye Parish and their rector Emmanuel. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Let us now pray for our country. Let us pray for Elizabeth, our Queen. And let us always give thanks to God for the freedoms that we have with her, under her. And let us also pray and give thanks to the First Nations, knowing always whose land we have all entered and the treaties which govern that entry. Praying especially today for the Frog Lake First Nation. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Let us now pray for those who are mothers, knowing that motherhood can and does take many forms. We also pray for all those who have lost their mothers. We pray for those mothers who have dealt with the pain of loss and a family strife. We pray for the Ukraine, as they suffer and defend themselves against the Russian invasion. We pray for all those who have had to flee war zones, and for all those who have faced racism, prejudice, and hatred, as they have tried to flee or find shelter from war. Lord, all, all true peace, ignorant knowledge, and love is yours. All ignorance, prejudice, vainglory, and hatred are your enemies. Give us the courage to promote knowledge and peace, to prevent ignorance and vainglory in ourselves and others, and to repent of the same when it happens, so that your kingdom may indeed triumph in this world. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Let us now pray for all who seek God. We pray for those who are preparing to be or have been baptized and confirmed this Easter season. And we pray for all those whose formal entries into the church continue to be delayed due to COVID. We pray that all those who are entering the faith be given strength as you see the power and works of God, even in the midst of plague, even in the midst of tribulation. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Let us now pray for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, those in trouble, those who must travel, those who are in prison, and anyone who might, be in suffer who might be suffering for whatever reason, aloud or in the quiet of our hearts. 
Today we pray for Roger, for Ed, for Gertrude, for Natalie and Hannah, for Dorothy, Jenny and Hughes, for Laura, for Margaret Ann and their, her family. We pray for Bob and James, Maureen and Marilyn, Nick, Sophia, for Serena, and for Raymond. We pray also for the faithful departed. Let us pray in particular for the repose of the soul of Michael, and also for those who have died due to the war in Ukraine, knowing that all those who mourn may hope for God's comfort. May the dead rest in peace and rise in glory Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord God Almighty, we remember that you are our maker and that we can never escape your presence. Give us the strength, therefore, to be people of courage and of generosity, giving and loving as our abilities allow, wherever we are, whatever the cost, for as long as you call and require it of us, remembering always the examples of the Blessed Virgin, the saints, and other holy peoples. And we pray this for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate, to whom with you and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Before we move on to the peace, we have a bittersweet farewell to say. Many of you probably know Meg. She's been in our choir on vestry, helping in archives, and doing just about everything else you can imagine around this church for quite a few years. She's been a tremendous asset and a joy to be around. She's moving home to Ottawa, so this is her last Sunday with us. So with that said, I invite everyone, let's Pray together, pray over Meg, and send her on her way with our blessing and our love. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for the extraordinary love, commitment, care, and creativity Meg has provided to this community of Holy Trinity. Through offering her gifts in the choir, on the vestry, in the archives, and as a dear friend to so many. Thank you for the way she has served us and given so much time and love to this community. We pray that she would go on to find new treasures each day and that the blessing of Christ would be upon her through all that she does, this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. I invite the congregation to please stand. My friends, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us share a sign of peace with those around us. the congregation to join in singing our offertory hymn number 218 Rejoice Angelic Choirs Rejoice
loving care, you spread before us the table of life and give us the cup of salvation to drink. Keep us always in the fold of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Shepherd. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to glorify you, Creator, and to give you thanks. For you alone are God, living and true, dwelling in light inaccessible from before time and forever. Fountain of life and source of all goodness. You made all things and filled them with your blessing. You created them to rejoice in the splendor of your radiance. Countless throngs of angels stand before you to serve you night and day. And beholding your presence, they offer you unceasing praise. Joining with them and giving voice to every creature under heaven, we acclaim you and glorify your name as we sing. reveal your wisdom and love. You formed us in your own image, giving the whole world into our care, so that in obedience to you, our Creator, we might rule and serve all your creatures. When our disobedience took us far from you, you did not abandon us to the power of death. In your mercy, you came to our help, so that in seeking you, we might find you. Again and again, you called us into covenant with you, and through the prophets you taught us to hope for salvation. O oh God, you love the world so much that in the fullness of time you sent your only Son to be our Savior. Incarnate by the Virgin Mary, he lived and died as one of us, yet without sin. To the poor he proclaimed the good news of salvation. To prisoners, freedom. To the sorrowful, joy. To fulfill your purpose, he gave himself up to death and rising from the grave, destroyed death and made the whole creation new. And that we might no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died and rose for us, he sent the Holy Spirit, his own first gift for those who believe, to complete his work in the world and to bring to fulfillment the sanctification of all. When the hour had come for him to be glorified by you, his heavenly Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. At supper with them he took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Creator, we now celebrate the memorial of our redemption, recalling Christ's death and descent among the dead, proclaiming his resurrection and ascension to your right hand, awaiting his coming in glory, and offering to you from the gifts you have given us, this bread and this cup. We praise you and we bless you. O 
God, we pray that in your goodness and mercy, your Holy Spirit may descend upon us and upon these gifts, sanctifying them and showing them to be holy gifts for your holy people, the bread of life and the cup of salvation, the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that all who share this bread and this cup may become one body and one spirit, a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your name. Remember, Lord, your one holy Catholic and apostolic church, redeemed by the blood of your Christ. Reveal its unity, guard its faith, and preserve it in peace. And grant that we may find our inheritance with all the saints who have found favor with you in ages past. We praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, through Christ and with Christ and in Christ. All honor and glory are yours, Almighty God, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Savior Christ has taught us. Let us sing. that we may live in you. My friends, these are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. The table is set. All are welcome. Our bread today is gluten-free for all to share in the one bread, one body. A quick note, as you will notice, the common cup is back. In the Anglican Church of Canada, it is considered 
full communion, full receiving, even just receiving one. You do not have to take the cup if you are not comfortable. You can take the cup if you're comfortable. You can touch the cup and receive a blessing if you're comfortable. Or you can walk right on by these two fine fellows and they will not be insulted. Do what is comfortable for you. And we will have everyone ushered one row at a time.
invite the congregation to please stand as able. Let us pray. God of steadfast love, watch over the church redeemed by the blood of your Son. May we who share in these holy mysteries come safely to your eternal kingdom, where there is one flock and one shepherd. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face and may the rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of God's hand and the blessing of God Almighty, Creator, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon you now and always. Amen. Amen. One quick reminder before we sing our way out of here, everyone is invited to hospitality downstairs, a great time to catch up, have some coffee, and perhaps say farewell to Meg. With that said, I invite all to join in our recessional hymn, number 378, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Mm -hmm.